Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. And we thank you for another Sabbath. And we pray as we have come together that your Spirit has brought us here that we may understand your word, that you may speak to us. We thank you that although salvation is an individual thing, we're not going to be saved alone. You have one body, even as there's only one head. Bless us as we truly become part of that one body. May we be ready when Jesus comes. We thank you for guiding us and for teaching us, for bringing us along the way that we need to be. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I hope that as we are going through this, that you're doing some reviewing, that you're going back into the Revelation to see how it's holding together, what the first chapter did, what chapter 2 and 3 did, what chapter 4 was all about, and then how chapter 5 worked. Those things should be in your mind because it's not difficult to have just one little thought for each of those places. And if you will do that, if you'll have the thoughts holding together for you, then you'll be able to work your way through the whole book of Revelation and see a picture. You'll understand what God is doing and why He had the Revelation written for us. We have dealt with the seals now, at least six of them. And so I've written the, the numbers up here in the way that we have treated it. What was the first seal? All right, so we have white, and it has to do with the experience of a Christian. Okay? So the white horse is victory, conquering. That's a Christian. The second one was red, and what did that mean? <laughs> well, it was a warning, wasn't it? The person who was over here was going to get bruised. And bloody, if they didn't pay attention, they needed to get back over to the first one, be sealed with the, as the white horse. The third one was black, which meant big trouble is ahead. If you don't get it right now, it's going to be over. And then the fourth one was the wrath of God. That was death. That was a terrible colored horse. So we have four experiences here of the four seals. One is victory, and the other ones show a person going farther away until there's no hope for them. So that ends the horses. The number five, there's no horse, because there's no place else to go. When you get to this one, the wrath of God gets you. It's over. The fifth one, you remember the people were saying, how long? So it has to do with time. The fifth one is not dealing with time. It's not dealing with an experience. And the sixth one is also dealing with time. So the fifth and sixth seals deal with time. And we found out that we are living between verses 13 and 14 in chapter 6. The next thing will be the sky departing like a scroll. We're not there yet. Then the rest of chapter 6 finished. The sixth seal is showing what happens to the wicked people. Okay? So you can get those thoughts very quickly. And you can hold on to them and you will know what they're doing. So, we never hit the seventh seal, did we? <laughs> Something happened. The entire seventh chapter didn't continue into the seals. The entire seventh chapter was about the 144,000 and the sealing work of God. And then it showed what they're going to do. So the entire seventh chapter was a parenthesis. It was thrown in there so that you would know not only what happens to the wicked, but what happens to God's people. So now those two experiences have gone together through chapter 7. And we are now ready to touch on chapter 8. We're still not to the seventh seal. 
<laughs> so let's see how chapter seven, uh, chapter eight begins. It says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, uh-oh, there we are. <laughs> chapter 8 begins. We're to the seventh seal now because everything has come together. God has told us what the four seals are in experience. He's told us about time. He's told us we're living between verses 13 and 14 of chapter 6. And now that we've seen chapter 7 that deals with God's people, the 144,000, now that we're ready for the seventh seal. Now, what does the number seven mean in the Bible? Complete. Yeah, it's complete. Okay? So, now we have reached the place where everything is complete, and when God takes off this seal, there is no more holding up the book. We can unravel the scroll to see what's inside then. But it takes the seventh seal before we can do that. So, I want to read this comment It's uh, by Joseph Seiss. The pioneers, I think, all read Joseph Seiss. I know that Taylor Bunch did because he quotes from him extensively in his books on Revelation. I think Ellen White knew about Joseph Seiss. He was quite an, uh, an individual. He was a Sunday keeper, but he was a real student of the Bible, and there's no reason to believe that he wasn't a real Christian. <laughs> This man understood some things. I want to read you something about his view of this. Uh, just part of it. It says, Seven seals are upon this book, indicative of the completeness of those bonds of forfeit, forfeit which have all this while debarred Adam's seed from their proper inheritance. The original estate is totally gone from man apart from some competent redeemer. Okay? So those seals that we saw up here, seven seals on that scroll meant you can't read what's inside. And he's telling us what's inside. It has something to do with man's estate. It's been sealed up and nobody can get in there. And we mentioned before, that's why John cried. Because as long as that's sealed, the human race is lost. All right, so then he continues. Sin cannot vitiate any of the rights of God. Satan's possession is a mere usurpation permitted for the time, but in no way detrimental to the proprietorship of the Almighty. So that's a fancy way of saying Satan has never owned this earth. <laughs> He has never really been the owner. God has always been the owner, and he never gave it up. So that's what this scroll is about, this book. It says, The true right still lives in the hand of God until the proper Goel comes to redeem it by paying the price and ejecting the alien. <laughs> Interesting way to put it. <laughs> ejecting the alien and his seed. John knew by the spirit in which he was what that sealed book meant. That book, uplifted and unopened, is the church's grief and distress. It bespeaks the inheritance unredeemed. It's all sealed. The children still estranged from their purchased possession, but that book opened is the church's joy and glory. It is the assertion of her reinstatement into what Adam lost, the recovery to her of all of which she has been so long and cruelly deprived by sin. Jesus is the lion sprung from Judah. He hath paid the redemption price of the forfeited inheritance. He is the true Goel, who having so far triumphed and been accepted, will also prove ready and worthy to complete his work by lifting those long-standing deeds of forfeiture. The opening of the seals is an act of strength an exploit of war, a going forth of power to take possession of a kingdom. As one after another is broken, out flies a strong one in fierce assault upon the enemies and usurpers which occupy the earth. And that's all I'm going to read of that. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. He's finishing up a whole section in his book. But he's telling it just the way it really is. Jesus is the Goel, the next of kin. 
He came to be one of us. So as a relative, the right relative, he could buy back what was lost because it was only lost for a time. It could not be lost always. God still owned it. <laughs> and so God has a way of buying things back, and it's through the, re through the Redeemer, through the next of kin. Jesus has done that. I don't know why it is so difficult for us as humans to understand that. He's not going to do it. He has done it. <laughs> he has bought us back. And that opening of the book is just saying, who's in the book? And when he's finished opening it, we will all know then that we were bought back. But still, there seems to be this element of uh, suspense <laughs> until he can get it open. All right. So this is very important what we're looking at. These seals. We are now to the seventh one. So what does the Bible say? It says that there was silence in heaven. <laughs> Half an hour. <laughs> well, there could be a lot of reasons for that silence. You know, Ellen White says that there was silence when, when Adam was created. Yeah. Every, all the heavens, all the worlds, all the angels, everybody, they all got silent because Jesus bent over to make this statue. <laughs> and I don't suppose I could see very well what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was silent. Can you imagine the whole universe was silent? <laughs> there were a couple other times it was silent. When Jesus was dying on the cross, everything got quiet. And this time, it's quiet. You know, what were they doing in chapter 4? They were all singing. They were all rejoicing. They were all talking about worthy is the Lamb. They were in anthems of praise in chapter 4 and chapter 5. But now it says they're silent. Why are they silent? Well, first of all, they're silent because it's finally been finished. We're to the number 7. There's no more after this. But there's another reason that heaven is silent. There's nobody there. <laughs> this says half an hour. And a lot of people debate it and wonder back and forth what's going on, but I don't think we have to wonder too much. This is prophetic time. And prophetic time, that breaks down to one week. It's quiet in heaven for one week. How come? Everybody's gone. They're, they've come here. And for some reason, it takes a week to get here. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us point blank, it's going to take us a week to get back. So there's another half hour. <laughs> so there's silence in heaven for half an hour. All right. Uh, uh, let's read just a little bit. Verse 2. I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Well, now, here is a problem. Do the trumpets come after Jesus comes back? That's what it looks like, doesn't it? Because everybody's gone first, and then the next verse says, Thou trumpets are given. This is one of the difficulties in trying to understand the book of Revelation. We have people in the Seventh Adventist Church right now who are saying that trumpets come in our time, all of them. They're out there teaching that right now. And I think part of the confusion is you can't really tell where these trumpets are based on the, where they are in the book of Revelation. <laughs> you have to study the trumpets to see what it is they do and then try to figure out what God meant by this because there's a parallel. And we are going to look at the parallel. All right. First of all, in Revelation 8, verse 7, we're going to jump ahead a little bit here and then we'll go back for details. It says... The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. third part of the trees were burned up, so forth. The first part of it is upon the earth. That's the first thing we want to notice. 
in the seven plagues. Where did they start? In chapter 16, verse 2, it says, they come upon the earth. So the trumpets say, one, the earth. The plagues say, one, the earth. <coughs> what about the second trumpet? Verse 8, it says, the second sounded, and it, uh, a burning mountain with fire was cast into the sea. So this one happens in the sea. Where does the second plague go? Chapter 16, verse 3 says, the sea. So the first is on the earth. The first is on the earth. The second is on the sea. The second is on the sea. The third trumpet, just quickly here, is on the waters, the fountains of waters, the rivers and fountains of waters. And in Revelation 16, 4, that's where the third plague is, the rivers and the fountains of waters. So are we picking up a pattern here? <laughs> the trumpets are doing exactly the same thing the plagues do. The fourth one, the sun is smitten, verse 12. In Revelation 16, 8, that's the fourth plague, the sun. In, chapter, in uh, Revelation uh, 9, verse 2, there's darkness. And in Revelation 16, verse 10, the fourth plague is darkness. The uh, sixth trumpet is on the river Euphrates, verse 14 of chapter 9. And in uh, Revelation 16, 12, the great river Euphrates. So far, they're exactly the same. In uh, the trumpets, the mystery of God is finished. Revelation 11, 15. In Revelation 16, 17, it says it is done. So the seven trumpets and the seven plagues are exactly the same. But there's something different about them in history. And that's how we're, we want to figure out here today. The trumpets are plagues. But they're not called plagues. In history, they're called judgments. And we'll see who the judgments are on in just a few moments here. But we want to get that much down to understand what's happening here. All right, as chapter 8 begins, uh, verse 3, it says, Another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So let's look at this incense for just a moment. For your notes, uh, we don't have time to hit a lot of this in these meetings, but uh, I'll give you places you can read if you want. Early Writings 252 and 256. Um... Patriarchs and Prophets 367. Okay, now I'm going to read you a little bit from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 353. In the offering of incense, the priest was brought more directly into the presence of God than in any other part, act of the daily ministration. Now I'm going to stop there because I want you to see these the pictures. She just said something that should take you to the sanctuary. And what do you see when you look at the sanctuary? I didn't draw that to scale. It'd be easier for you to see it if I do it this way. Remember that the sanctuary itself, inside the court here, the sanctuary is three identical cubes. We usually don't think of it as cubes because there's nothing in the middle here. We just see one large room. But we must understand these are three identical cubes. And in all the pictures you see, the altar, the golden altar, is against the curtain. I don't believe that's where the altar was. I believe the altar was in the middle of the middle cube. 
which would put it exactly in the middle of the sanctuary. Now, Ellen White makes some cryptic statements. She says that God's people come. They approach God from the east, from the west, from the north and the south. And where did they meet? They don't meet in the most holy place. They meet at the altar of incense because this altar is higher than any of the other articles of furniture. It's the tallest thing in the sanctuary. You are closer to God at that altar than any other place in the sanctuary. Okay? That's the symbol there. It's the tallest. <laughs> you are closer. And that altar represents prayer. We are closer to God in prayer than any other thing we do in the sanctuary. Okay? Now, prayer by itself is not enough. There has to be the incense. <laughs> and that's why we're looking at this. The incense, when that burns, gives off a smoke and a perfume. And that goes right into the presence of God. It goes into the most holy place. It fills up the whole sanctuary. And that incense represents the righteousness of Christ. Okay? So when we pray, it gets mixed up with that incense. And our prayers then go before God in righteousness, the righteousness of, of Christ himself. So I want you to remember that as we read these kinds of statements. I'll read that sentence again. In the offering of incense, the priest was brought more directly into the presence of God than in any other act of the daily ministration. See? That's how he came closer. That tall prayer and into the most holy place. All right, next sentence. As the inner veil of the sanctuary did not extend to the top of the building, the glory of God, which was manifested above the mercy seat, was partially visible from the first apartment. As in that typical was partially, I'm oh, sorry, as in the typical service, the priest looked by faith to the mercy seat, which he could not see. So the people of God are now to direct their prayers to Christ, their great high priest, who unseen by human vision is pleading in their behalf in the sanctuary above. The incense ascending with the prayers of Israel represents the merits, the intercession of Christ, his perfect righteousness, which through faith is imputed to his people and which can alone make the worship of sinful beings acceptable to God. So what makes everything acceptable to God? The merits of Jesus only. <laughs> so don't think you're ever going to get good enough for your, to stand in front of God. <laughs> only Jesus. All right. So it says, Before the veil of the most holy place was an altar of perpetual intercession, before the holy, an altar of continual atonement, by blood and by incense. God was to be approached, symbols pointing to the great mediator through whom sinners may approach Jehovah. The plan of salvation is always about Jesus doing something. Always. We look at the wrong place when we're trying to figure out what I need to do to be saved. It's what Jesus is doing to save me. <laughs> yes, it's a, a comment here, a sweet smell in God's nose. That's exactly what the Bible says. It's a sweet smell to God. He loves it. <laughs> you know, when we pray in the name of Jesus, the Father just loves to hear that. Because Jesus, it means we accept that sacrifice and we understand it and we believe it and the Father is honored. So he loves to honor the prayers that come in the name of Jesus in his character. All right. Early writings 32 uh, between the angels was a golden censer. Above the ark where the angels stood was an exceeding bright glory that appeared like a throne. Oh, I lost this. Excuse me. 
Okay, I'm okay. I don't know what that was. But it told me this is gone, so that's all right. <laughs> all right, we're still on? Okay. Uh, and I'm going to stop there since I stopped. The ark is out here. Where is she talking about? I mean, the golden altar. What, what is she talking about? In her statement that I just read. The censer. Where did she say the censer was? Between the angels. Well, wait a minute. Here's something that has confused scholars all along, including some of our own. The censer, some of them think, belongs out here because it's part of the altar of incense. But there was a time when the incense w was in the most holy place. When was that? Yeah. The Day of Atonement, once a year. This altar moved in here through the portable incense censer. They had the same kind of fire in it as here, holy fire and the same kind of incense. Only they took it, the high priest took it into the most holy place. So now the golden altar is inside the most holy place through this censer. It's a very simple concept, but many people have missed that. And they say, no, you're talking about the holy place. No, it's the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. Okay? So there's no problem. Above the ark, where the angels stood, let's see, yes, that's right, was an exceeding bright glory that appeared like a throne where God dwelt. Jesus stood by the ark, and as the saints' prayers came up to him, and incense in the censer would smoke, he would offer up their prayers and the smoke of the incense to his Father. So, according to this statement, Jesus is in the most holy place, the Father is in the most holy place, and the prayers of the saints go to the most holy place. Now, there's nobody else in the world that knows this except Seventh-day Adventists. Nobody! <laughs> in early writings, page 55, she says that in 1844, when Jesus moved, when the Father moved, when the angels moved, everybody moved, the people who did not want to believe this continued to pray to the holy place. And she said, Satan answered their prayer. Yeah. Because they wanted to invent a gospel of their own. They would not do it the Bible way in reality. Jesus was in the most holy place. And that's why by faith we follow him there. That's what that statement means. But we are not in the most holy place. <laughs> that's where some of the conservatives have gone wrong. They think they have a most holy place experience because that's where their prayers are going. No. They have a holy place experience. That's sanctification. The most holy place experience is a sealing. That's where a person gets sealed is the most holy place. And when a person says, I have a most holy place experience, I don't think they know what they're saying. <laughs> well, some of them do know, and I, it's not true. They say, I'm sealed. They haven't been tested yet. The Bible says we must be tested before we're sealed. <laughs> and you know what the test is? It's the Sabbath. Because when this nation passes laws to enforce Sunday, that will be our testing. And this country has not done that yet. So there's a whole series of things that have to happen before we can know we are in the process of being sealed. I just throw those in because all of that's happening very quickly here. This, this seventh seal that we're talking about here, everything is done. Or the time when it's all finishing. I'll put it that way. I'll come back to that. All right, so the censor is an important thing here. In um, early writings 280, I don't think I gave you that page. I'll read you a little bit from there. 
As Jesus moved out of the most holy place, a cloud of darkness covered the inhabitants of the earth. There was then no mediator between guilty man and an offended God. No mediator? Something has happened. What happened here? Verse 5. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. The fire is no longer, I mean, the sense is no longer going to do what it was doing before. They put fire in it and threw it on the earth, which means the intercession of Jesus is over. This seventh seal is truly the wrap-up of everything. All right, continuing reading what Ellen White said here. While Jesus had been standing between God and guilty man, a restraint was on, upon the people. But when he stepped out from between man and the Father, the restraint was removed and Satan had entire control of the finally impenitent. Satan had entire control? That means every person who is not a Christian at this time is demon-possessed. So there's only going to be two classes of people on this earth when this happens. Christians and demon-possessed people. There is no third category. It was impossible for the plagues to be poured out while Jesus officiated in the sanctuary, but as his work there is finished and his intercession closes, there is nothing to stay the wrath of God. Now, fire does two things in the Bible. Okay. It purifies. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. And it also consumes the wicked. So it does one of two things. The fire is the same. <laughs> the fire does not change. It must be the material that makes the difference. <laughs> Re we remember Daniel, at least his three friends. When that higher fire was heated up seven times hotter than it was before, the men who were to throw in the prisoners couldn't get close to it. It killed them. It was so hot it killed them <laughs> before they even approached it. But they got the men in there anyhow somehow. And those three men were in there with the fire. And the fire did not hurt them. It was real fire. <laughs> but there was a reason it didn't hurt them. Isaiah 33, 14 says, We, which means the redeemed forever, shall live among everlasting burnings. The energy level of the redeemed is like fire, and fire can't hurt them. <laughs> they are fire. And those three worthies that were in there, the fire couldn't hurt them because they were just like that fire. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> this is a real thing we're dealing with here. God allowed the energy levels to be turned on. Say, hey, this is who we are. This is the kingdom of light. <laughs> so this fire is going to be put on the earth. Don't get the idea God's punishing somebody. Don't think like that. When God puts the fire here, it, the fire just does what it does. It purifies the righteous and it burns to death the wicked. And it's not God's fault who chooses what. Don't lay this on God. He's just putting the fire. That's all. We make the choice. 
And he's trying to warn everybody in the world how this works. You know, Ellen White, we might give you that statement here, great controversy. She says that, that Satan has fooled people into thinking that God destroys people just because that's who he is. She, no, sin is its own destruction. It's sin that destroys. God isn't doing that. Wherever he goes, it's love. But love wipes out sin wherever it goes because sin can't be where there's love. <laughs> For some reason in our psychological minds, we think God has to love even sin. Well, he can't do that. <laughs> he can only love purity and righteousness. Because if he loves sin, when he gets close to it, it's destroyed. So there's a lot of hiding in these little verses as we go through. We've got to pick this up. This is at the end of time. This is when it's all wrapping up. All these things are coming together. And I'm just giving you an overview right now because we're not giving you the specifics of these verses. All right. Um, Let's uh, look at the trumpets for just a moment. Jeremiah 4, verse 4. It says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. And the word Lord there is all capitalized. What does that mean? Jehovah, okay? Every time you see that, put it in your mind. Jehovah. It's the name of God. It's not just a Lord. It's not the Lord. It's Jehovah, His name, who He is. You know, I could say, uh, talk to this man over here. And that's pretty generic, man. But when I say, talk to Dick, that's a whole different thing, isn't it? Yeah. Talk to Dick. Not, not just a man. We don't want to think of God as just a God. He's Jehovah. Very personal. Very real. All right. So it says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, to Jehovah. Take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare ye in Judah, publish in Jerusalem and say, blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together, say, assemble yourselves, let us go into the defense cities. So the trumpet is the way God announces things. And in this case, judgment. Okay. The trumpet of judgment. For your notes, you might look at uh, Joel 2, verses 1 and 2, and Zephaniah 1, verses 14 through 17. That'll give you a little more on the trumpets. So these trumpets have something to do with the plagues. This statement, I think, has been misunderstood. It's been used by different ones. And I'm going to read it to you and see what you come up with. It's letter 109-1890. It's in uh, the Bible commentary too. I don't remember the page on that. All right, here's the statement. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. Vial after vial poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. Scenes of stupendous interest are right upon us. Now the statement said, events are before us. And then she said, trumpet after trumpet will sound. What did she say? There are people that believe and teach that this means the seven trumpets are in the future. Is that what she said? Let's pay attention here. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. She did not say the seven trumpets. That's what people put in that statement. But that's not what she said. 
She said trumpet after trumpet. Did Ellen White know what trumpets meant in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> she knew that trumpets are warnings from God. I, I believe that what she's saying here is that trumpet after trumpet is going to be sounding right in front of us. God's going to give us warning after warning after warning and the world will be given warnings. And I find nothing here that creates a problem in understanding the scriptures. It's only when we introduce our own thoughts into things. Then she says vile after vile. Well, certainly we think about the plagues. But the seven plagues are not the only plagues. Okay? So be careful how you read the Spirit of Prophecy and even more, be careful how you have people interpret things for you. Don't accept everything that comes by you no matter how much you trust them. See what the statements really say. So does it say that there? Or are they putting something in it? Be very careful. There are a lot of sincere people who get a thought flash in their mind and they think it's the truth. Well, it's not the truth until we measure by the Word of God. We've got to have the Spirit speak to us in these things by His Word. All right. So, we have these parallels then between the trumpets and the plagues. They have to do with judgment. One is judgments in history and the other one is the judgment at the end of the world. <laughs> okay. This morning I got a phone call. Some people in New York were arguing about Armageddon. <laughs> I don't know why they were doing that, but they were arguing about Armageddon and one person thought it was something spiritual that happened from Adam and Eve all the way through and, and another one thought it was going to be a battle someplace and they were arguing over this. So I got this little call and I, and I said, well, I said, maybe you're both right, maybe you're both wrong at the same time. What, what, <laughs> it, it is spiritual, but it's also literal. But it's not a battle someplace. And it didn't start with Adam and Eve. <laughs> so once they were all confused and we went through it, I'll just tell you quickly now since I said that what I told them. The word Armageddon is two words. Har and Megiddon or Megiddo. The word Har means mountain. So it's not the valley like everybody says. <laughs> it's a mountain. <laughs> And the word Megiddon means slaughter. The mountain of slaughter. It happens after this. It happens at the seventh plague. The mountain of slaughter is planet Earth. This is where Jesus comes back and all the wicked will die. That's the first phase of Armageddon. But that's not the end of it. There'll be a thousand years of peace on this Earth because there's nobody alive. <laughs> <laughs> all the redeemed will be with heaven with God in heaven at the end of the thousand years we know they're going to return then the wicked will be raised and then Armageddon will be finished there will be a fire that doesn't go out until everything is burned up that's supposed to be burned up and when it's burned up according to Psalm 37 only the smoke is left that's it just smoke. So Armageddon happens when Jesus comes back, but it has two phases. Okay, so hold on to that. All right, I want to read a statement here from Great Controversy. This one's an important statement. Page 35. There are the Jews' sufferings are often represented as a punishment visited upon them by a direct decree of God. It is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. I hope you've never told anybody that, that God punished the Jews that way by a decree. That's what Satan wants people to believe. All right, I continue. By stubborn rejection of divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them. And Satan was permitted to rule them according to his will. Who made the choice? Their stubborn resistance 
pushed God away. Then he let Satan come in there. See? But they made the choice, not God. <laughs> okay. It says, The horrible cruelties enacted in the destruction of Jerusalem are a demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. So what are we looking at over there? What happened to those Jews? We're not watching God squash them. We're watching Satan do it. Because that's what they wanted. They let him. This whole plan of salvation is a matter of perspective. Who is God in our own minds? Are we making him some sort of a monster? Something he never has been? Are we creating our own view of God? Or are we seeing the way the Bible says it? Who he really is? We cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and long-suffering in holding in check the cruel, malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression. But he leaves the rejecters of mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. The Spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner and then there's left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. The destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. Get into that page. Try to understand what it's saying. 35 and 36. There's power in this page if we just understand who God really is. He's doing everything He can do without forcing us <laughs> to see what love does and how it works and what He's already accomplished. In 7T141, this frightening statement, this earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work His will upon it. So what are the trumpets for? Well, they're warnings. But who are they warnings to? Yeah. You see, God has put them in history so we can look at them and say, you know, it happened just the way He said. He wasn't kidding. When He pulled away from this, this happened. And then the next thing happened. And then the next thing. And so the seven trumpets are there so we can look at it because it's coming again. On the earth, on the sea, the fountains, the rivers of waters, the sun, it's all going to happen again. But God has given us an opportunity to look back and see how it happened before. And I have to tell you, Seventh-day Adventists are the only ones who know these things. I don't think any of us realize the privilege we have of having been called into this movement, this message. Because God has told us things nobody else in the world knows. The book of Revelation belongs to us. And it's a shame for Seventh-day Adventists to wander around and think they don't know what's in the book of Revelation. Because God gave it to us for a reason. (laughs) 
So judgments and scourges are involved. All right, let's look a little at this now. The first trumpet, hail, fire, and blood upon the earth. Ezekiel 38. Verse 19. In my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea, the falls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep upon the earth. And all that men that are all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Who's talking here? Yes, Jesus, isn't it? Yes, the loving Savior. That's who's talking here. This is not some vindictive God out there. This is the Redeemer talking. Why is He talking this way? Well, He's certainly not mad at these people because He's upset at them. He's talking to them this way to get their attention, to understand how serious it is. They're going to lose their salvation. Salvation that He is giving as a gift. It's serious. It's horrible. But we must not think that he's trying to get even with them. <laughs> I mean, who is God that he should try to get even with anybody? <laughs> Any one of us today, if God wanted to get even, we'd never make it home. <laughs> yes, think about that for a second. If God really decided, I don't want you to go home, guess what? <laughs> A train could fall on you from out of nowhere. <laughs> God doesn't have any problem with power. <laughs> He's using it all to keep us alive in spite of ourselves. Because we do things every day to kill ourselves. <laughs> yes, you think about that. <laughs> He's fighting against us all the time to keep us alive. <laughs> You know, I've seen this week several times when different things could have finished it for me. I've become tuned in to some of this. I know I miss lots of it, but I've tuned in. <laughs> and I can see it when a car comes from behind me someplace that I didn't see him, and there was nothing I could do about it, and all of a sudden, it's okay. Yeah. Even things that could get me in trouble that I didn't necessarily have anything to do with. For example, I was going down one street here in Portland. Light was in my favor, no cars in the way, no problems of any kind. I went to make my turn, and a pedestrian jumps off of the sidewalk in front of me. <laughs> I managed to stop in time. I thought, look at that. <laughs> Mind in your business, and they jump in front of you. <laughs> but the Lord's constantly protecting us from things that we don't know anything about. All right, so when you read statements like this, don't do what many of our students in our schools tend to do. They say, well, there's two different gods. There's this angry, terrible one, and then there's Jesus. No, this is Jesus. We better find out what he's doing here and why he's doing it this way. It's not him that's the problem. <laughs> you know? Those children of Israel were slaves all those years. And God took them out, and what did he have to work with in that desert? <laughs> Even Moses! <laughs> he got all excited himself and says, Oh, look at this! 
I th I'm sure he would rather go back to the sheep. They were easier. <laughs> a million and a half of these. But he loved them. And even with all the love that he had for that nation, he knew how ignorant they were. And so God had to do some things. There were no highway patrols out there. There were no sheriffs. Nobody to keep them in line. So God said, He picks up sticks on the Sabbath. After I've told you not to do it, they get the rocks. Picking up sticks on the Sabbath for you out in the desert at this time effectively schedules you for the second resurrection. And we said, well, that's kind of tough, isn't it? Not when you're as dumb as they were. And, you know, we're not much better. <laughs> we don't get the rocks, so we take more chances. And we say, oh, I'm sorry, God. Let me do it again. But, you know, God has not changed. I don't know why people think God has changed. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God. Pure and holy, and He can't live with sin. And since we can't stop doing it, His only solution is to get us to believe in Him who kept it perfectly, and then He says, we did it, and it's okay, so we can learn how not to sin anymore. But we will never learn how not to sin if we're trying to do it to get saved. Only a person who has salvation can learn how not to sin. You've got to get it first. <laughs> and that's the problem with most of us, is we're trying to get good enough so we can get saved, so we can stop sinning. It's backwards. It's never going to happen. <laughs> and I know there are millions of frustrated Adventists. I know. I've talked to lots and lots and lots of them. <laughs> Honest people, sincere people, lovely people, but frustrated because they know, I can't get good enough. Well, that's true. But Jesus is good enough. And if you get over there, He'll help you to become like Him. And God accepts that. And you know, God means us to be like Adam before he fell, before this is over. Do you know that? Yes, we are to live like Adam lived before his transgression. That is, in a pure mind, totally connected with God, please doing whatever God said. That's us all the time, every day, as we learn what Christianity really is in us. But we're not going to get there by trying to get good. <laughs> that is a self-trip. That's an ego trip. Please remember the first meeting we had. We talked about two things. We talked about the nature of Christ, and we tried to talk about what started this whole mess. Remember, when Lucifer which means light bearer, Luchisferas, was the closest being to God. He was the highest thing God created. When he walked around, everybody noticed. Ezekiel tells us that his, his clothes were rubies and topaz and emeralds. And, yeah, that was his clothes. <laughs> he was something. And he knew it. <laughs> That's where the trouble started. He said, oh, there's nobody like me. Except maybe Jesus. And maybe I better get over to there to see why they worship him and they don't worship me. Yeah, that's where his brain went. They don't worship me. How come? And what did he get in his head? Once the father told him, well, Jesus is God. Lucifer said, well, I'll be God. He went for the top. I will be 
like God. I'll control my life my way. Forget God. And he put that in man. Man chose it. He couldn't have done it any other way. But man chose to be like Satan. And he thought the same thing. I will be my own God. I'll do it my way. And that's what Jesus is trying to take away from us. Because even Jesus didn't say, I will be like God. He says, I'll be like dirt. That's what it says in Philippians, the second chapter. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's not the way it says it in the Greek. That did not account it a thing to grasp that he should be God. That's what it says. Now, let me try to get a hold of that. He was God. <laughs> But he was willing to give up all the prerogatives of being God if that's what it took to save us. So Satan says, I have to be God. And Jesus said, I'll give it up. That's the difference. Jesus is willing to do that so we could be saved. Do you think maybe we could be willing to give up our stupid little selves so that we can let him save us? Do you think it's okay to give up our cherished sins? Ellen White says, darling sins. <laughs> I mean, what are we giving up? <laughs> it's a strange thing, isn't it, that we think we give up something to become a Christian. Yeah, the seventh seal. When we hit here, it's all over. There's no more chances. It's over. We have to understand this and get in the right place. And so God sends fire. And hopefully in us, it will purify us. That fire. You know, God is a consuming fire to sin. You know what you're asking for when you ask for Jesus to come live in your being? There's only one thing that's going to happen. <laughs> He's going to consume sin. That's right. So that's what we need to ask him to do is, Lord, come on. Come on. Consume the sin in me so there's nothing left. Mount of Blessings, page 2, that's what it says. That when Jesus comes to occupy the throne of the heart, she says, He first prepares it to be a habitation for His Spirit. That's just the second page of that book. <laughs> he prepares it. Don't think because you gave up cigarettes or you gave up wine or you gave up cursing or you gave up whatever that you made room for Jesus. You didn't do a thing. He prepares what he needs to be there. And when he does it, it's for real. I want to remind you, we're, we're looking at things we know. John, the first chapter. I want you to see this very clearly. Is it any wonder that Ellen White told us that if we understand the book of Revelation, we will have a decidedly different religious experience? The book of Revelation brings it all together for us. Okay, in John 1, verse 13, verse 12 and 13, it says, As many as received him. Now, now this does not say as many as believed in him. That isn't what it says. <laughs> as many as received him. He came inside. What did he have to do first? Okay, he had to prepare the way for his spirit to be there. It says, as many as received him, to them, what? He gave power. It doesn't say that someday they're going to get it. 
No. When he comes, that's what he brings. He brings a power to do what? To become. You mean I'm not there yet? No, not me. When he comes in, I still have to become. But my becoming is not to become a Christian. I am a Christian. What am I becoming? <laughs> as many as received me, gave them power to become the sons of God, to be like the angels, to be like the unfallen beings of other systems, to be like Adam before the fall. He has come in me to give me power to become. And then it says, even to them that believe on his name. He just told me what my work is as a Christian. There's only one work that we have. There's not two. That's to believe him and the one that sent him. We have one word, to believe every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. Isn't that what Jesus said, Matthew 4, 4? When I believe every word he says, wherever I see it, however he says it, I can know I'm one of those. There's not a question because the natural man can't do it. You know, he says, I will give you power to tread over snakes and scorpions and they shall by no means hurt you. Do you have that power? Jesus said he gives it to you. What's that mean, snakes and scorpions? <laughs> it doesn't mean you can walk over there and pick up a rattlesnake and put it on your mouth and kiss it and when he bites you, nothing will happen. There's churches that do that, you know. <laughs> That's not what it means. <laughs> What's a snake? Serpent. Revelation 12, 9. That old serpent. Yeah, it's a symbol of the devil, isn't it? Scorpions are demons. Jesus says, I will give you power over the devil and all of his demons. Don't think you are subject to devils. You are a Christian. The devils are subject to you. Now, don't get all puffed up over it because it's only Jesus they're afraid of. They're not afraid of you, <laughs> okay? But if Jesus is there, that's enough. He says, I give you that power. Now, I want to ask you, do you believe that word? It's over there in Luke. It's a clear word. Do you believe it? Because that's one of the words that Jesus said to believe. The Christian lives by every word that proceeds from the word, mouth of God. And that's one of the words. Jesus said, if you have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, what? You can move mountains. You tell that mountain over there. Ask them to the sea. Do you believe that word? He said it, and he didn't say it just because he didn't think of something else to say. It is the truth in God's kingdom. If you have a hard time understanding it, that's okay. We all have things that are hard to understand. <laughs> but you better believe it because he said it. It is the truth. And you better ask him to show you what it means in your life when the time comes for you to demonstrate that little bit of faith. Amen. Because it's going to come to each one of us. The real thing. You know, he could have made it a lot tougher. He made it so easy. He just said mountain. You know, over there in the book of Judges, there's a man who told the sun to stand still. <laughs> When's the last time you thought of doing that one? <laughs> there was a man who said, Lord, make it stop. 
And so Jesus didn't remind us of that over in Judges, the 10th chapter. He just looks at us and he says, okay, we'll, we'll just talk about mountains. <laughs> the theologians come along and say, well, that was just a metaphor. It was just a way of getting a truth across, you know. No, there's a real Jesus. When the time comes, that real mountain is going to go away. Not just mountains of difficulty. You know, Spirit Prophecy does say that, that he was talking about mountains of difficulty, but she does not negate the other idea. She never does. It was cast upon the earth. I think it's enough to know that we're dealing with it right here. Then it says the third part. That's kind of an interesting little phrase. Uh, we could spend probably a few weeks just with that, but I want to give you some scriptures you can write down and look at them and see what they say to you. Exodus 23, 14 and 17. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. 2 Chronicles 8.13 Numbers 22.28 um, 1 Samuel 20 verse 41 1 Samuel 20. Daniel 6 verses 10 and 13 and Acts 11.10 those are all I'll give you for now. Read those sometime and, and see if you can pick up a trend of some sort. The way God deals with this, this third concept, third part. Just for now, it's enough for us to understand that what he was telling us historically is that there will be a substantial amount so it would be recognized. But it won't even be a majority and it won't be most. Just a substantial amount. That's a key. That's a key to what we'll be looking at as we go through here. The trees are a symbol of God's people. Uh, and in one place they're burnt, in another place it says you can't burn them. But here, if we're going to deal with the trees as God's people, it's Psalm 1, verse 3, Isaiah 65, verse 22, and in volume 7 of the testimonies, page 22, she says point blank, that's what the symbol means. Was Israel a tree? Yeah, Jesus used them. When he talked about it, he talked about the tree. He looked, pointed the fig tree one day. <laughs> that was Israel, wasn't it? What did he do to it? The disciples had never seen him do anything like that before. He was always growing things and making things nice and just keeping everything beautiful. He looked at this tree and said, that's over. Withered, gone. The next day it was all shriveled up. They never saw a tree like that. He said, look what he did. Why did he do it? Yeah, well, the scripture says that, that when he went there, he was hungry, and the tree had all kinds of leaves. And those kinds of trees only put out leaves when they have fruit. So he went in there and, and looking around, and there was nothing, just leaves. <laughs> so it was a fitting symbol of the church of that time. He said, you've got all kinds of leaves. Boy, you talk good. There's no fruit. So what did he do to it? You know, he's getting ready to do it again. Read Desire of Ages, chapter 64 sometime. It's about that tree. And she finishes the chapter by saying, what will he do this time? And she leaves it unanswered because she says it's up to us. What we do will decide if we're going to end up like that as that kind of a tree. But it has not been answered. 
It's still sitting there, the question, what would Jesus have to do this time? The, the title of that chapter, by the way, is A Doomed People. Why did he take that tree out like that? Surely he was giving us a story to look at and understand, but why did he do it? What was the point? Israel was not only fruitless, that was bad enough, but that tree was sitting in a spot with leaves everywhere and shading all the ground so nothing else could grow there. So it was taking the place of something that would be good. That's why he did that. God's not too pleased with a creation that gets in the way of something that could be there if they weren't there. If the church gets in the way again, it's going to be the same thing. He could have had a good church. So all these things gang up on us. We need to think it through. Am I just fitting in? Am I just one of the boys? Am I just one of the, like everybody else? Am I Laodicea? That's right. That's the question. And please, don't look around. <laughs> You're never going to do any good looking around. Because everybody else is wrong. You know that. <laughs> Yeah, that's the way it is, isn't it? <laughs> there were these two. You know the story about the, the two. Uh, well, it could be two anythings. The story usually gets out was uh, the, the, the Quakers. Somehow that whole church was decimated. There was only two people left. And the one looked at the other one and he said, Well, I always had my doubts about all those other ones anyhow. I knew they couldn't last. They wouldn't be, they couldn't hold down. He says, And now there's only you and me. And I really have my doubts about thee. <laughs> That's human nature. Don't look around. <laughs> this is the place. It's the only place you know anything about, and you don't know that very well. <laughs> but doesn't Jeremiah say it? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can understand? Yeah. Page 159 of Christ's Object Lessons, Ellen White says it. No man can understand his own errors by himself. Well, if I can't even understand my own errors, how am I supposed to understand everybody else's? <laughs> well, we say, oh, but I can see there. So, oh, no, you can't. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. We don't know how a person got there. We've got enough to deal with right here. And let me tell you, if we get this right, we won't want to look around anymore. <laughs> because Jesus is not like that. So that dry, unfruitful tree, it's right here in this verse. Because in this verse, God says, burn them. Who's he saying burn? Burn. It's okay to burn him. He's permitting it. He's going to let the devil, through this trumpet, do something with the church. Who's the church at this time? This is the first trumpet. This is the Jewish people. And they got burned. Remember. God. Great Controversy 35. It was not God doing it. It was Satan doing it to them because they chose it. They rejected God. They pushed him away and he couldn't protect them anymore. And Satan came in there. And they thought they could be protected running into the temple. But there was no God to protect them anymore. So Satan went right in after them and their blood was running down those steps. Horrible, horrible scene. All right, I'll read you one now. Christ Object Lessons 215 to, I'm sorry, 
I don't want to go there yet. Desire of Ages 582. There it is. 582. The parable of the unfruitful tree represented God's dealings with the Jewish nation. The command had gone forth, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? In other words, why are they getting away of something that will grow there? But divine mercy had spared it yet a little longer. There were still many among the Jews who were ignorant of the character and the work of Christ. The long suffering of God toward Jerusalem only confirmed the Jews in their stubborn impenitence. Please listen to that sentence. The long suffering of God only confirmed them in their impenitence. What does that mean? Well, I didn't get a lightning bolt today, so I guess I still have another chance to do it again. That's what the Jews did. I wonder if anybody else does that. <laughs> Isn't that something? How can we take the mercy of God and the fact that He lets us keep living and He keeps blessing us to say, well, it must be okay for me to live like this. No, it isn't okay, but He wants us to learn. But we see what they did, and we can see where it went. In their hatred and cruelty toward the disciples of Jesus, they rejected the last offer of mercy. Then God withdrew His protection from them. Have we heard that before today? Then He withdrew His protection from them and removed His restraining power from Satan and His angels, and the nation was left to the control of the leader she had chosen. I'm sorry, that's Great Controversy 27. I'll give you Desire of Ages next. Uh, yeah, that's Great Controversy 27. Okay, you got your notes squared away. Now I will go to the tree in Desire of Ages 582. The cursing of the fig tree was an acted parable. That barren tree flaunting its pretentious foliage in the very face of Christ was a symbol of the Jewish nation. The Savior desired to make plain to His disciples the cause and the certainty of Israel's doom. In the barren tree they might read both their sin and its punishment. Withered beneath the Savior's curse, standing forth, sear and blasted, dried up by the roots, the fig tree showed what the Jewish people would be when the grace of God was removed from them. So God uses trees as symbols of humans, and in this case, His church. And this first trumpet is going to deal with that church with fire. That's what we're learning here in, in this first trumpet. Desire of Ages 743, from the fall of Jerusalem, the thoughts of Jesus passed to a wider judgment. In the destruction of the impenitent city, he saw a symbol of the final destruction to come upon the world. He said, Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and on the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? By the green tree, Jesus represented himself, the innocent Redeemer. So he's the green tree. All the impenitent unbelieving would know a sorrow and misery the language would fail to express. Christ Object Lessons 2.15. At the bottom it says, Israel was a cumberer of the ground. Its very existence was a curse. Did you get that? The church of God was a curse. Now, the devil must have been really happy about that one. But, of course, you can't get ahead of God. I'm going to finish reading here. Its very existence was a curse, for it filled the place in the vineyard that a fruitful tree might fill. 
The day of wrath was near in the calamities that had already befallen Israel. The owner of the vineyard was mercifully forewarning them of the destruction of the unfruitful tree. All right. Grass. The grass is to be burned up too. It says that in verse 7. Grass is a sign of uh, flourishing people, flourishing vegetation, and it's the fruit of righteousness. I'll give you scriptures to work with. Uh, Isaiah 44, verses 3 and 4, and Isaiah 43, 19 through 21. There are others, but th that's enough for what we're doing here. In the Bible, there are examples of grass that once was growing that had to be destroyed. In Joel 1, verses 19 to 20, the grass is wiped out. In Psalm 37, verses 1 and 2. In Psalm 92, verse 7. And in Isaiah 40, verses 6 and 7. Where does judgment begin, anyhow? The house of God. That's right, isn't it? Peter tells us that. The judgment begins at the house of God. Uh, Ezekiel tells us that. Begin at the ancient men. Judgment begins at the house of God. So that's where the trumpets begin. The house of God. The trees and the grass. Now please, don't turn into a person who will eventually leave the Adventist church. Do not say that the judgment has to begin with the Adventist church. The house of God includes more than the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do you know that there are faithful ministers in the Nazarene Church? Yeah. There are faithful ministers in the Methodist Church. There are people who serve as leaders in those churches who are living up to all the light they have and they lead the flock with them to worship Jesus in a correct way, in a devotional way, as a real person. I mean, it's only logical. We don't have to have lots of spirit prophecy in Bible for that. It's logical. If God has children in those churches, He has to have someone who's a faithful leader also every now and then. And that's exactly what Ellen White does say. She says, in order for God to keep His children correct and, not, and right with Him, there must be some faithful shepherds there. So don't worry about how God handles the other churches. He has children in those churches and He has ministers over there. We know, too, about the apostasy. I mean, we know that too well. And we have apostasy in our own ranks. Okay? Yeah, it's, it's sad. But we can't hide from that. We've got people in our ranks who don't know any more than some of those Sunday keepers. But don't throw out the baby with a wash. God has a church. And it's a true church wherever it is. Work of destruction begins among those who have professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false watchmen are the first to fall. The false ones. Okay. If there are false ones, there must also be true ones. Okay. So don't forget that. There's two sides to this, always. Don't always look for the bad because you find a bad statement. Know that it means just part of the story. There are true shepherds. 5T to 11. This statement has been taken out of context so many times, I'm almost afraid to read it, but I'll read it to you. <laughs> the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. I have read so many papers where they say, see, the Seventh-day Adventist church gets it first. She didn't say that. <laughs> she knew how to write Seventh-day Adventist church. And she wrote it on several occasions. But here she says, the church. The church. <laughs> okay. The church in this world. God's church, wherever it is. It's amazing to me that people can quote one statement to prove their point and miss another statement that they quote also and don't know that it contradicts what they just said about the other one. Here's another favorite quote of theirs. Upward look, page 318. When two or three are gathered in my name. I am there also 
This alone constitutes a church. That's what Ellen White says. And every reformer out there quotes that page and says, See, it's not the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. It's when two or three are gathered. Well, wait a minute. What did they just say? It's true. She was not talking about the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, but she wasn't talking about their idea either. The church is two Sunday keepers who are real Christians out there getting together. That's the church. Don't make her statements always mean Seventh-day Adventist only. She doesn't talk that way. We are his last day movement. And he has shown us more than he has shown any other group. We have privileges that all the rest of Christianity all together have never had. To be a Seventh-day Adventist, to be called to that place is something I don't think we understand yet. We've been called to finish what God has been doing for 6,000 years on this planet. We are to be a holy people. Completely sanctified. That is set apart for God's use. You know, there's no reason for us to be alive on this planet unless we're doing something in God's kingdom. I mean, what other reason should we be sitting around here eating all this food and, and just having a good time? We're here to serve in whatever capacity he asks us. Let me finish the statement. The ancient men, those to whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people, had betrayed their trust. Those are the ones who are going to feel it first. They betrayed their trust. They became a job. They became professionals. They no longer talked to God. They no longer had a message for the people in His Spirit. So this first trumpet is laying the groundwork for a lot of stuff we will be looking at. We have six of them to go yet. <laughs> and I even talked about the seventh seal yet. Did you notice that he did not tell you what happened in the seventh seal? <laughs> but the Bible says it in lots of different places. What happens in that seal? Next time we will talk about some of those things because it's all in the Bible. But for now we're trying to get warmed up to the trumpets. They're serious. They are warnings. They are the equivalent of the plagues. But in history... And as it happens, in the Revelation, each one gives us a little more details until the fifth and sixth ones fills up a whole chapter, each to tell us the great details so we can know for sure that this is what God is trying to tell us. Okay, we'll get into that next time, the, the uh, rest of these. We want to finish this one for now. Uh, great Controversy 21. Looking down the ages, he saw the covenant people scattered in every land like wrecks on a desert shore. In the temporal retribution about to fall upon her children, he saw but the first draft from the cup of wrath, which at the final judgment she must drain to its drags. So the next time around, there's no, no sparing anything. In the past, God has always had to do things in such a way that somebody's left. <laughs> Keep it going. When this last one hits, when the number seven hits in all these series, there's none of that anymore. God does not have to put up his hand and say, well, wait a minute, let's save, son. No, this time it's all the way. Some of the most frightening words I have ever read in the Bible where when I first was, was studying Seventh-day Adventism to see what it was all about, it was over there in Revelation 14. God's wrath poured out unmingled with mercy. When I read that, it just... So what does that mean? Unmingled with mercy? 
And the more I look into it and study it and try to understand it, the more I see that's exactly what it means. There's coming a time on this planet when there's no mercy exercise. He has to pour it all out and let it all go and nothing's going to stop it. Testimonies to Ministers 232, the judgments upon Israel were a symbol of the events of Christ coming to judgment in the last day. A symbol? <laughs> a symbol? Some of you may have gotten the glimmerings by now for this time, and in there I just make one little statement that these final events that are coming upon us, these things that are happening all around us, that maybe we don't even take time to think about them because we're just too comfortable. Yeah, we've got nice cars, we've got food, we've got homes. Nobody's hollering at us. <laughs> we just don't think about it. Well, I don't say this should become something that possesses us. and We shouldn't have fear over it, but we should understand, you know, Am I really moving along with this? Am I making the preparation? Am I thinking like a person who's going to heaven? How many people went to Palestine? <laughs> right. The same thing all over again. You know, this first trumpet, maybe I've said too much around it, this first trumpet is about the church. The first trumpet is went to Jerusalem. It went to Israel. That was God's church. God has not changed. If he had to do that to his church once, he'll do it again if he has to. And don't look at the buildings. That's not the church. Don't look at the conference president. He's not the church. The church is the church. It's the people of God. The ones who have committed to Christ. It's the movement. In our case, we have identified with the Seventh-day Adventist church because we claim to believe that message. But God has to deal in truth and in righteousness. He cannot change. And the only way we meet any of this, any of it, is to hear Jesus say, Come unto me. And that's where we go. That's the only thing that's going to count with God the Father. If we heard Jesus say, Come unto me, and that's where we went. He never said, come to the Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm sorry, he never said that. He never said, come to Ellen White. He never said, come to the pastor. Come unto me. And if we get there, he will turn us into a faithful Seventh-day Adventist. He will do that. Because he's called all of us into this message. There's no one here who hasn't heard something. <laughs> okay? We've been called. And he doesn't waste his time. He calls people he intends to use. Malachi, we're called jewels. And of course, once he gets that jewel, it doesn't look like a jewel when he gets it. <laughs> it's just that rough old piece of rock that isn't worth much, apparently. But then he starts grinding it and cleaning it, doing the whole thing. And I don't know how many jewels you've worked with. I haven't worked with many myself, but they get kind of hot when you work them. <laughs> that heat is generated pretty quick in the grinding and all that. And I guess if one of those rocks could talk, they'd say, Don't do this to me! <laughs> but there's only one way you can get it to look, like that diamond. And there's one little phrase 
that I'm reminded Peter uses. It's a tremendous, he knew it by personal uh, experience. He uses the term lively stones. Living stones. What's a living stone? <laughs> yeah. Living stones all fitly put together to make the building, the temple. That's the only kind God puts in that building. Not rocks, not concrete. Living stones. The only way you can get a living stone is for that stone to have its own light source from within and just radiates. It's not reflecting. It has a source of light. That source of light is Jesus. When He's inside of us, we become a living stone that gives off light. These are pictures that we should get in our head. See a, a thing there that looks like a rock pulsating with its own light coming out of it. <laughs> That's what God wants to make of each one of us. Matthew twenty three thirty seven. Thirty thirty seven, I'll say twenty seven thirty seven. Yeah, Matthew twenty three thirty seven. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's talking to a city. <laughs> o Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And you would not. Who made the choice? You would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So he told his church, and do you know Jesus was crying while he was saying those words. This was his church. He came to save his people. He says, here I am waiting to gather you in. And they rejected him. Thus, we don't have a king except Caesar. Get away from us. Can you imagine what that must have done to Jesus to have his own church in front of the pagans saying, this is our king over here. We don't have any other king except him. And so here he is crying. And Ellen White tells us he was convulsed. He couldn't control himself in the kind of crying he was doing. Looking at what he came to do and it wasn't going to get done. And he had to say it. Your house is left unto you desolate. You're divorced. Forever. That's it. Nothing can ever change it. That's forever. Now we know that some of the Jewish people came across and became Christians. Okay? And they were all right. But you couldn't do it as a Jew anymore. In 1844, Alan White says, The people who heard and understood and refused to follow Jesus into the most holy place stood in the same relationship to God as the Jews that crucified Christ. To reject the Seventh-day Adventist message under knowledge is not a good thing to do. The first trumpet is there for everybody to look at. What happened? to the Jews when Satan got a hold of them. They said, God, go away. We'll do it our way. So he had to go away. 
they did it their way. All right, that's the first trumpet. We won't do any more today. We won't get into the second trumpet. We'll try to do two or three trumpets next time. When we get into the, the Middle Ages, we're going to have a lot of history to look at because the Bible is very precise because it wants us to know something. It's going to lay down some dates that will take us right up to the Seventh Adventist movement. And the people out there who are changing all these trumpets around and making them say new, new things, they wipe out the Adventist movement. And I'm sorry, but anything that does that does not have kind things coming out of me. God has written, had the Bible written in certain ways so that we can be certain who we are as a movement and we know what our work is. To take any of it away just makes us like the other churches. And God's already told us what He has to do with those. He's going to have to withdraw from them too and call His people out. So get in and dig. Read through the next, through chapters 8 and 9 and see what you find. It's not easy always. But see what you find and maybe you can find some different things. And if you have some questions, uh, bring them up. We'll see what we can do with them. Is that a comment that I didn't get to down there? About the 1844? Yeah, no. That's a little, okay. All right. Okay, are there any questions about what we did today? Anything come up? One question here. Green pastures. Those make us me to lay down, lie down in green pastures. <laughs> yeah. This is the, in the midst of the church. That's right. So you're breaking down the symbols already. It's consistent. And you go through. I think I mentioned it to some of you. I'll just say this as we close today. So you see that no matter where you go in the Bible, it's here in this picture. This picture covers everything. <laughs> That's the north, in, according to the sanctuary. The enemies of God consistently come from the north. And there's a reason for that. In Psalm 48, God is the king of the north. Verse 2. So who would the counterfeit king be? King of the north. <laughs> So there is a counterfeit king of the north and he's the one that operates on this earth. It is Satan. He says, I am the king of the north. Well, he always attacks God through agencies, through kingdoms and everything, the king's, God's true people. And he comes from the north. Now this is the table of showbread. And it's on the north side. It's the only thing on the north side. So if God is the king of the north, this is his throne. The table of showbread is called the bread of the presence. The presence of who? God. So this is the throne of God. When Jesus went to heaven, this is where he went. He went to the throne of God, his Father. To the holy place. The enemies come here. And the child of God lives by faith. The Christian lives by faith in the holy place. That's their sanctifying experience. They live by the bread. They have a prayer life. They become the light of the world. They live through the Spirit, the oil. So this is where a Christian lives, by faith. That's their experience. So when Satan attacks a child of God, he's got to get to them in that room, the holy place. So if he's coming from the north, what does he have to go through first to get to them? Scripture. <laughs> He's got to go through God. 
<laughs> so in the 23rd Psalm, David says, as a part of God's church, Thou preparest a place for me, and so forth. Then he says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He was saying, I am invincible in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and do you know that Ellen White says that? Christ Object Lessons 147, I believe, she says, Talk and act as though your faith were invincible. <laughs> When's the last time you talked like that in Sabbath school? Uh-huh. Talk and act as though your faith were invincible. And it better be, because everybody's going to laugh you to scorn and say, Well, who do you think you are? <laughs> Hey, I'm a Christian. Jesus lives in me. I am an impregnable fortress because Satan can't touch Jesus and he can't touch me either unless Jesus allows it. Okay? Now, that's what the Bible says. That's what the sanctuary says. Now I will read you what the spirit of prophecy says. That's three witnesses. And when you get three witnesses saying the same thing, it's the truth of God. Okay? That's how you can know if you know the truth. If you can find it three different places, it's the truth. Testimonies to ministers. Now, Mount of Blessings, page uh, 71. That's, that's the one. And we'll close with this thought. Okay, remember the picture. The Father's presence encircled Christ. Here's Jesus. The Father's presence encircled Christ. And nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. You see, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, he could say, this is from my Father. This is good for the world. That's why he could love doing it. He wasn't up there mumbling and griping. He decided it, and he loved doing it. It was a hard decision. It was not easy for him because his humanity said, We can't get this done. I'm not strong enough. But he decided it, and the Father gave him the strength. He had everything he needed then. He was fortified spiritually, and his faith took him all the way through. So notice that statement. It says, The Father's presence encircled Christ. Nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort. And it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Oh, so now this is you inside of Christ. The blow that is aimed at him. Here comes a blow from Satan. The blow that's aimed at him. Where's it go? Falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him, oh, it got through. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. So where did that blow come from? Doesn't matter where it started. It comes from Christ. I see the lights coming on. What does that do for complaining? <laughs> oh, we, we have no place to stand, do we? <laughs> if 
you complain, you're, you're saying to Christ, you have no idea how to run this world. I don't like what you're doing. No, I didn't say these things. It's the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and the sanctuary. They all say the same thing. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission. And all things work together for good to them that love God. But that's what Paul was trying to say the whole time. He knew all of this. <laughs> he lived in it. Over there, when he was writing to the Corinthians, he said, Hey, folks, you're not going to tell me anything new. I have been there. I've been dragged off of the city dump. They thought I was dead because they stoned me. <laughs> he says, I've been over there. They threw me in the water to die. I've been mobbed. I've been every place. I've done all these things. He said, you know what I've learned? It's the same to me as being rich and with all this stuff because I've learned to be content no matter where I am. I'm in Christ. That's why the people could stand there and be burned to death. They were in Christ. So what? But here it is. The Christian stands here. Jesus surrounds them. The blow comes. Remember, if it comes through, it came from Christ. Don't go any place else with this. From Christ. Our part is to stay in this circle. Because if a blow comes to us that we did to ourselves, we have nobody to blame except us. Jesus didn't do it. <laughs> so there's a difference. Peter talks about that. He said, oh, when you suffer for God's sake, it's a, it's a good thing. He said, but don't think you're going to get any glory for doing the dumb things and you got the punished for it. <laughs> Somebody got to you because of something you did. It had nothing to do with Jesus. So let's be sure we're in this circle. That Jesus is our portion. Okay, maybe that's enough for today. As we go through this, remember, I don't hear, so if, it would be helpful to me if you think of something that would help the rest of the people or for clarification, that you write it down. Just hand it in and we'll see what we can do with it. Okay, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you that right now, at this very moment, we can call you Father. There was a time we didn't know that. There was a time we couldn't be sure about it. But we thank you that through Jesus, we can be totally confident that we are accepted in the Beloved. He already has done everything that satisfies you. And that by being in Him, we are complete. We have everything. We thank you, Lord, that as we recognize the reality of it, as we move with you, knowing how your kingdom works, that we have be are becoming the children of God, the sons of God, as it says in the Scripture. We are learning how to be like Jesus. Help us, Lord, to see it doesn't come overnight. But we, we mustn't become discouraged. We mustn't think that because we can't see all the signs of us in every portion of our life, that somehow it didn't work. Help us, Lord, to sense instead that Jesus is the true answer. We must hear that voice over and over again, Come unto me. The Sabbath is all tied in with that idea. You've told us that every object in nature is another call to us. We hear the voice of Jesus saying, Come unto me. We thank you, Lord, that you will never cast off anyone 
who comes in the name of Jesus. You've never done it. You're never going to. Help us to put our trust in Him. And then as we are broken down, knowing how horrible we really are by ourselves, that that will make the cry louder, that we can rely on You. We thank You that when Jesus comes and He gives us a crown, our first reaction is going to be to throw it at His feet because we don't deserve it. It's His crown. But we thank You throughout the ceaseless ages we'll know that those marks in His body mean that He did it willingly and that He rejoices to have us with Him. The thought will never cross our mind that we did something good to get there. We hope that You will teach us that now by whatever means it takes so that we can recognize the gratitude that we truly owe You and the life that we can live in your spirit. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.